As railways began to shift focus towards moving passengers, ideas were being put forward on how to make operating passenger routes more efficient, specifically on lines with low traffic. The need to use a locomotive to move just one carriage was very uneconomical, and time was usually wasted running the engine round to the front of the train for return journeys. In an ideal world, the carriages would just move themselves, which got some people thinking. Why not just put a small steam engine in the carriage so it can move on its own? Possibly the first example of a self-propelled carriage, or railcar, ever built was designed in 1847 for the Eastern Counties Railway. Essentially, all it was was a carriage with a vertical boiler and set of driving wheels bolted to the front. While it did function as intended, the design was never picked up or further pursued as it was awkward to operate. Several other designs were built and tested between 1880 and 1900 in Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Hungary, and Australia, but these two didn't last very long, owing to lackluster performance. While the concept itself was sound, nobody took particular interest in railcar designs until the early 1900s, when tramways started to use compact steam locomotives to operate services around urban areas before changing to electric. With the demand for transport increasing, railway companies wanted a cost-effective way of being able to operate low-traffic passenger lines so they could compete with tramways, and as as such turned their attention back to rail motors. On paper, they were perfect for lower traffic routes, as they were compact and could be driven from both ends, making them easier to drive and saving on infrastructure. On a busy day, an extra carriage could be added to help increase passenger capacity. The rail cars used on the Great Western Railway were also compatible with their auto coaches, allowing the driver to drive from either carriage without an issue. On top of this, they could stop anywhere to let people on and off, saving the need for dedicated stations and staff, with the guard on board selling tickets. Rail motors were mostly operated in the UK, however they were built and used in Africa, Australia, Japan, Brazil, India, the US, France, Egypt, and more. While they were ideal for the low traffic lines they usually operated on, they quickly fell out of favour with many of the railways that used them. To start, they were significantly more awkward to maintain compared to a standard locomotive and carriage setup. Not only were steam locomotives harder and messier to maintain, but because the carriage and the engine were one combined unit, it meant that the carriage would be unusable during servicing and repairs. Not to mention how hard it was to keep the interior of the passenger compartments clean while clearing out the engine and filling them with coal. Servicing also had to be carried out in carriage sheds, as locomotive sheds weren't designed to accommodate them. This not only made it more awkward to maintain them, but also ended up with coal, dust, and ash from the engine making the other carriages it was stored alongside dirty too. On top of this, despite rail motors being able to stop for passengers more frequently, they still couldn't compete with tramways in this respect in urban areas. Not only that, but each rail motor required a three-man crew, driver, fireman, and guard, while most competing tramways only needed one person to operate a tram. But the biggest problem most steam rail motors suffered from was their overall lack of power. Their boilers had to be quite small to fit within the carriage frames, and couldn't be replaced with bigger ones without taking up more passenger space. As a result, many designs were unable to handle pulling any additional carriages or goods wagons, significantly limiting their versatility. This was especially a problem on market days or public holidays when an increase in traffic was expected. The greatest irony is that the rail motors could initially do their job transporting passengers on quieter routes, however, their success led to more people travelling on these lines, and as a result, they just couldn't keep up with the demand. In the end, most railways realised that any economical benefits the rail motors had were significantly outweighed by their limitations, and as a result, ended up scrapping their rail motors and just running standard push-pull services instead. With railways like the Great Western, converting their rail motors into auto coaches, which proved to be much more reliable. It wasn't until the 1930s, when diesel traction became more common, did rail motors emerge again as rail cars and rail buses. While they were still a pain to maintain, they required less people to crew them and were considerably more powerful. With the introduction of multiple unit designs, rail cars have made a comeback since the 60s, operating on low traffic lines and filling the role that their steam-powered counterparts couldn't. In the end, steam rail cars were perhaps sound on paper, 
but not in practice. Since the concept of a self-propelled carriage has proved itself to be both functional and economical in recent times, steam rail motors then are a textbook example that not all ideas are bad, it's just the technology might not quite be there to pull it off. Subscribe for more.